Hello, and welcome to the GRACE podcast series. My name is Denise Brock, and I am the Operations Director for the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, or GRACE. In this podcast series, we interview patients, advocates, and healthcare professionals to provide the most updated information for our community and to highlight important issues facing those dealing with a cancer diagnosis. We hope you find this information valuable. For questions or comments, please visit us at cancergrace.org. Hello, I'm Jared Weiss, Associate Professor of Medicine at UNC's Lyme Comprehensive Cancer Center and Vice President here at cancergrace.org. It's my privilege today to talk to you about adjuvant osimertinib. Regardless of stage, outcomes with curative treatment of non-small cell lung cancer are not what we'd like them to be. The standard treatment is surgery, and in patients whose cancer proves node positive, or perhaps those that are at least four centimeters, our standard is four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. In exchange for the side effects and inconvenience of those four cycles, depending who you ask, we expect a roughly 5 to 15% survival advantage. Real, uh, but far from the insurance policy we'd like to have. When we look at outcomes by stage, they're also not nearly as good as we'd like. The most advanced stage that we treat for cure, stage three, we see that by five years, our recurrence rate is 76%. In the more limited stage two disease, it's still over half at 62%. And when we look at the much earlier stage 1B, still our five-year recurrence rate is 45%. So this is a massive unmet need. When we look at metastatic or stage four disease, we know that osimertinib is a very good drug. It's less toxic than chemotherapy. Uh, and for patients with EGFR mutation, the disease control uh, in exchange for that decreased toxicity is actually superior. So great taste and less filling. And the question here is, can it provide the same trick in the curative intent setting? And so enter the ADORA study. ADORA was a randomized study for patients with stage 1B to 3A EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. Sorry for that mouthful. Patients uh, got whatever they and their doctor decided was standard treatment, so surgery either with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, then they were randomized to either three years of osimertinib or three years of placebo. The primary endpoint of the study was disease-free survival in stage two and three patients. Disease-free survival is a curve that ticks down every time cancer grows or a patient dies. And what we see here is that the patients on osimertinib did far better than the placebo-treated patients, with an 83% improvement in this endpoint. When we break it down by stage, as we might expect, the patients with the most advanced stages derived more benefit than those with the most limited stages. But at all stages, there was a benefit. But this brings up an important caveat. When we do surgery and sometimes adjuvant chemotherapy, at the completion of that standard therapy, some patients are already cured. Unfortunately, we don't have the technology in the year 2020 to know who is already cured, meaning all cancer surgically resected or eradicated, and who still has microscopic residual disease that can later hurt them. And when we give adjuvant maneuvers, be they chemotherapy or here osimertinib, we're doing it recognizing that we're going to help some people and not others. But for those who have no cancer to treat, they're getting side effects with no benefit. So it's important for us to look at how bad those side effects are. We see here that they're quite real. 48% rate of diarrhea, 26% paronychia, which are nail side effects, 23% dry skin, and so on and so forth. And so when we're talking about stage four and comparing this to chemo, it's easy to say, well, this is much better than chemo, and so there's a human advantage. When we're talking about stage one to three patients who may already be cured, it's important to note that this is a real side effect profile. Now, finally, the most important question really is whether that disease-free survival is going to translate into a long-term survival improvement. I showed you the massive numbers, and so at first glance, it's tempting to say, wow, with such a huge DFS advantage, surely it will, except that history tells us that that's not always true. What you're looking at here at left are PFS curves uh, from a similar study with Jafitnip showing a large DFS advantage that unfortunately did not translate to a survival advantage with more mature follow-up. There are other examples of the same. 
So the question really here is, if we give the osimertinib nerve early, which is to say at the adjuvant time, will we improve cure rate or at least survival as compared to giving it later? At this time, that's a completely unknown question. This has been a very controversial trial, and some are even saying that based on design, we may never properly know that. Onto a happier thought, in the era of COVID-19 and controversial data, I thought uh, a moment of normalcy might lift all of your day. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you again for joining us. This podcast was made possible by the generosity of sponsorship from our friends at Lilly, Novartis, Takeda, AstraZeneca, and Exalexis. Please like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Send us feedback, share your story, donate and visit us for more information at cancergrace.org. Thank you for listening.